Hello, welcome to Strictly Money, where all voices matter. I'm your host, Sajal Patel. In case you missed it last week, Alberta wants to leave the CPP. While the announcement surprised many, what came as a bigger shock was the amount Premier Daniel Smith believes the province is entitled to. About $334 billion, or just over half of the entire pension assets. The question many Canadians have is, can they leave? And where does that leave the rest of Canadians? Joining me now is Bonnie G. McDonald, Director of Financial Security Research at the National Institute on Aging, and Doug Chandler, Canadian Retirement Research Actuary. Nice to have you both on today. Good morning. This is, uh, this is getting a lot of play. So, um, Doug, let me start with you first, because I think a lot of Canadians are wondering whether Alberta can leave the Canadian pension plan. And my understanding is yes, but the process, they do have to go through a process. So can you, can you talk about this? That's right. Uh, back at the beginning of CPP in 1965, Ontario asked for a money back guarantee in case they changed their mind and wanted to go the route of uh, Quebec and set up their own plan. And that was never taken out of the legislation. The legislation also lays out a process. Yeah, in terms of two, uh, what would they actually need to do? There's two answers to that. There's the the long answer and there's a the short answer. Uh, the short answer is that they basically have to give three years notice. They need to settle on the transfer with the rest of Canada, which would probably be argued out either through negotiations with other provinces or even through Supreme Court. Now, if they do go ahead of, with it, they will need to actually start doing what the CPP and, and the federal government has been doing to service a CPP. Mm. So they would have to do what Service Canada does. It has to, they all have to do what Revenue Canada does. And that's a really massive job. And it's actually estimated to cost itself as much as $1 billion. Yeah. They'd also have to start untangling the contributions between the provinces. They have to figure out how much money is uh, and work is being done in Alberta, how much is being done in Quebec and Canada. And then they'd have to settle this up with the rest of Canada as well as Quebec. And then finally, they would also have to potentially take on the job of CPPIB, which is to actually invest those funds. Yeah, that's a, that's a onerous <laughs> process. Um, so can we just talk about the amount then, right? $334 billion is what Premier Daniel Smith or this LifeWorks study that they commissioned is saying that they would be entitled to, but others are saying that's actually not accurate and it's around 20% of the pot or you know somewhere around $120 billion. What's the right figure? There are a few things going on here. Uh, the LifeWorks study made a point of saying they didn't have the data they needed. And once Service Canada went through the whole process of uh, interprovincial migration and working out who had employ uh, contributions in which province, the right figure could be anywhere between $262 billion and $362 billion. And taking account of temporary workers, the people who came from the Maritimes to work in uh, oil and gas construction projects in Alberta could make that number even smaller. So some experts are saying that the technical problems, this, that, that's the first problem. The second problem is that some experts are saying that there's a technical problem with the way LifeWorks interpreted the legislation because it effectively gives investment earnings on investments that were never there because they were used for benefits in other provinces. Um, and that that brings you into the range of 20 to 25%, according to the to those other reports, instead okay. of the 53% that LifeWorks came up with. Okay. And then there are some other people who are saying that the whole idea of a money back guarantee is wrong. And Alberta should get maybe 15 or 20% of the assets in CPP uh, to put them on an equal footing going forward. Um, Bonnie Jean, I'll ask you this one because I know um, Alberta believes it can save somewhere around $5 billion by re repatriating their share. Does that sound right? Yeah, I'm going to turn that to Doug. Okay. Doug? Yeah, that's just the uh, annual effect of the windfall on uh, either contributions or benefits. That's just the way the funding process works. Okay. Okay, that sounds good. Um, we only have uh, 20 seconds and we'll start this. You talked about the negotiation with the provinces. That could get pretty difficult. Yeah, um, it could be. There's no actual requirement for negotiation. That's the position Alberta's taking. Okay. That it's laid out in legislation. Uh, in fact, it's probably going to end up either as litigation or as 
was saying the legislation is unclear, it has to be amended, in which case it requires agreement of seven out of 10 provinces uh, representing uh, two thirds of the population. Okay. Welcome back. Um, just before the break, we were talking about the fact that they may have to negotiate with the the amount with other provinces. Doug, continue what you were what you were saying. This could go a lot of different ways. If it gets really ugly, I can imagine, say, Canada doing something like uh, refusing to amend the Income Tax Act to allow for deductions for Alberta pension plan contributions. The way they're they're they're, they're uh, taken into account in uh, the Canada pension plan and Quebec pan pension plan contributions. But really, I expect this is going to be settled either in litigation or in amendment to the act through negotiation. Okay. Uh, one of the fears that I, at least I see with, with CPP and, and trying to divide the assets, which you, you both have talked about, is some of these assets are long duration assets, right? They're, some of them are illiquid. So what sort of impact could that have? Well, the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board has lots of investments that are don't have a clear market value or be hard to sell. Mm -hmm. But that isn't really much of an issue. Okay. Uh, both the CPP Investment Board and the Alberta Investment Manager, whoever it is, will want to have those kinds of investments. And there'll be at least three years to figure out which ones gets transferred and which ones get left behind. And there are lots of instances where big pension fund investment managers uh, have shared ownership of big pri private infrastructure projects. I just don't see it as an issue. Okay. Um, Bonnie Jean, residents are going to have a say on this, right? In Alberta, at least. What should they be asking? Um, you know, what, what sort of things should they be thinking about? Because the way I'm seeing it framed, at least, you know, from, from government is, it's, it's pretty enticing to say yes. Yeah, I mean, I could talk about the rest of the more general Canadian senior experience, but then I think yeah. Doug would be best positioned to talk about, he actually is from Calgary and lives in Calgary yeah. to talk more about the Albertans perspective. But what I would just say, number one, from the individual's perspective, that even people in Alberta to understand that by leaving the CPP, they are losing quite a bit of protection that exists in the CPP. And that's the government's governance structure. It's very hard to change the CPP and they would lose that protection in by going into a, a single province plan, and that's just the nature of it. Um, I'd also like to mention that the timing, whether you're living in Alberta or outside of Canada, really the timing of these kind of changes are, are really as bad as they can get. Uh, we're basically facing the biggest demographic change in Canada, Canadian history. We have the most uh, people ready to get into retirement that's ever happened in history. Uh, and these seniors are going to be facing, uh, a, they're going to face basically a perfect storm. They have longer life expectancies. They're going to have less employer pension plans. They're facing escalating inflation. And also the other expectation is that they're also going to have much fewer adult children to care for them as they get older. Yeah. So the CPP really was that really safe program that exists in Canada to protect seniors and their families. And if that fund starts to bleed, uh, it's not going to be just the seniors that are going to be impacted. It's really going to be all of us, whether it's going to be through higher contributions or also whether we have to then support elderly members of our own family. So I would say that we really need to be proactive when it comes to population aging. Mm -hmm. And this proposal is taking us in the opposite direction. Um, Doug, like Bonnie Jean said, you are in Alberta. So you're, you're seeing it from yeah. pro perhaps a different angle. What are your thoughts? Well, I'm a fourth generation Albertan, which makes me a bit unusual, but about half of my CPP contributory earnings are in other provinces because I have moved around to follow uh, economic opportunities. My children have accrued CPP contributions in four different provinces. Uh, and I didn't stop caring about my parents' pension when I moved out of, moved to Alberta. They didn't stop about their parents in Newfoundland or wherever they came from. Um it's if you think about it in terms of yourself and your your relatives and the people and the people close to you, that doesn't mean that you want a good deal for the next generation of Alberta contributors. Um, and uh, I, I think that's you know for a lot of people that's what it's going to come down to: are they Albertans first or are they Canadians first? And who are the people that they want to see benefit? And do they like that idea of 
uh, moving around uh, following economic opportunities, because that's going to continue to happen in Canada. Yeah. Um, we only have 20 seconds left, and I'll throw this one at either one of you can answer that. Do you think that other provinces are paying attention to this and, and we could see others follow suit? Yeah, I, I think the other provinces are really focused on, in general, I think people, especially COVID, really woke us up to the challenges that are going to face us uh, with the senior population. And that's, we're really at the... Um, just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to our population aging. So I really hope that the provinces are going to, you know, band together to actually come up with better solutions.